feed and stuff. So thank you all for coming out, and we'll be uh, ready to go in just, just a minute or two. Thank you. Hi. How are you? We're good? Okay. All right, guys, thank you so much for coming out. It's uh, my pleasure here to be here uh, for Backstory Events and Guitar World at the Cutting Room in beautiful New York City. Uh, and today we're going to have, as you know, a great interview and then performance with Rich Robinson and Mark Ford of the Magpie Salute. And uh, yeah, let's hear it. So Magpie Salute are in uh, town. they got some shows coming up tomorrow night in Fairfield, Connecticut, and then uh, Wednesday and Thursday at Irving Plaza in New York, one of my favorite venues, and I'm sure a lot of you guys here are going to be there, and everyone listening uh, out there also. I just checked, and there's a handful of tickets available, so I would grab them because I'm sure they won't be there on the night of the show. I hope you, you all can come. Magpie Salute have uh, their first album out, and we'll be talking about that and about the show, so let's bring uh, Rich and Mark up and give them a big welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us here, guys. So congratulations on uh, everything that's happened in the last last year or so. So, um, I mean, a year ago, I think, you didn't have Magpie Salute didn't exist. Now you've got all these shows under your belt. you got an album out. Um, the, the, the band actually came about quite organically, right? Can you, can you tell us a little bit about um, the... Sure. <laughs> I was touring on my solo record last year in 2016, and um, this opportunity came up to do these shows in Woodstock, and it was something I had done before, and it was, and I and I remember thinking it was a cool thing to do, you know, uh, and so, but I wanted to do something different, and the older I get, the more that I realize what a uh, gift it is to play with people that you have this musical connection with, and. You know, to to be excited about what it, someone is bringing to the table. You know, so with Mark, I mean, I remember bringing songs to the Crows and just being like, I can't wait to hear what Mark plays on this. Or the same thing with Ed. I mean, you know, just sitting in a room and having these songs, and just it, Mark's first thing was amazing. Ed's first thing was amazing. You know, to me, and I was like, man, you know, it was it was it was just great. Um, and so having that connection and then also thinking about just the spending a lot of time on a bus with someone is a pretty intimate experience you know you see people at their best and their worst you see them first thing in the morning you see them the la you're the last to see them <laughs> when they go to bed so it's kind of uh interesting good night dear <laughs> yeah <laughs> and it's uh but to me it was it's profound in a sense because you have and and it was it was odd to to have that existence with Mark and Ed and just have them go. Right. Did you, you know what I mean? Like just then they're just not there, and it, it and there was a that's an odd feeling, you know, because you do spend such concentrated time, and all of those reasons, I just was like, I'm gonna call Mark and do something cool and different and bring. And then I called Mark and he was into it, and then I called Ed, and Ed's like, hello, and I'm like, hey man. <laughs> you know, you want to come to Woodstock and play? Mark's coming. All right, man, I'll be there. You know? mm. He's excited. So it was cool, you know. And it, and it proved proved me right. <laughs> Mark, what, what was your reaction when, when Rich called you? Uh, okay. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it didn't really matter what. It was just to play music again and to go there and just to say, how are you doing? Had you guys been in touch? I know you hadn't played together in about ten years. No, it was just we were on the on like when we had the flood. I mean, Mark's guitars were up way up high, so they weren't just a lot. Some of them weren't destroyed, and so when all the gear came out to L.A., Mark and I had a mutual friend. I'm like, man, just tell Mark his guitars are here, and if you can bring them to him, go ahead. And so, you know, yeah, I heard about your dad. And I, yeah, and you re reached out about that yeah. as well. 
Yeah, I mean, not everyone might not know that story. So y your guitars were in storage here in New York, in right? Jersey, yeah. in, and and they got flooded in yeah, they all in got Sandy, flooded. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and and then so I, well, how much did you end up losing? You, I guess you personally was it was not just yours. It was no, the like Black Crows. Seventy. Right? Well, ninety percent of the Crows gear was mine. Just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I collected a lot of guitars over the years, and they had tons of amps and horseshit. Uh, but I was 70 guitars and tons of amps, right? I mean, lots. Uh, how many dumpsters of stuff did you throw away? Three? 70 yard, uh, what were the 360 yard dumpsters worth of shit. And then we just tossed it because it was beyond repair. Doug had <laughs> sent me pictures of himself in a hazmat suit. Because it was filled with mold, you know, there was like what two or three weeks where you couldn't get in There was too much debris and then finally when it opened everyone that was allowed in there had to wear hazmat suits to keep the The mold off, you know, and so th I, I saved four guitars really well, And then we went on tour shortly <laughs> after yeah, which was great Wait, Did you save four because there was the four savable or were there four that you said that we must save these four? There was four that I said that you know, we real I really wanted to say, you know, my gold top and my three thirty five and you know, and luckily or luckily for me, there's this company in somewhere down in the south, Lexington, Kentucky, that restored a bunch of stuff from the Nashville flood. And uh, they were able to save those two guitars. And then I sent one of my guitars to the manufacturer and they put a new back on it. One guitar turned out better. The rest of them are kind of shit. I don't care. Well. <laughs> we, we did an interview for Guitar World not too long after that, and and you had a, you had a pretty good attitude about it. I mean, part of you was sort of like, well, the Black Crows had a lot of bad juju, and that maybe that washed it away, right? It's true. I mean, energy is energy, and and not to get too. Some people get you know, cosmic or gnomish. <laughs> a lot of people have talked about <laughs> that shit. But on the flip side, uh, there is an energy that attaches to certain things, and when something is incredibly unhealthy and can be really dark, you know, either by proxy of what I place on those objects symbolically or, or legitimately, there's bad energy attached to that shit. And and that and water in certain cultures does clear that water takes that energy away, and so in a sense, at first. I was kind of, I didn't even think about it. I was, you know, oh shit, that sucks. You know, I'm, I was actually in Atlanta and I was like, oh, well, you know, those poor people and just going on with life. I'm like, holy shit, my stuff's up there. <laughs> and because I saw footage and they were like, there's, you know, 10 feet of water and, you know, Weehawken, which is exactly where our stuff was. And I called Doug and Doug was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said there was seven feet of water that filled the space. And when he would open my guitar vaults, water poured out of all the guitars, and some of them just had it. And they were just soaking in there for, you know, several weeks. Mm. I, but, feel like you know, we, I feel like we have to be quiet now. <laughs> like a mom <laughs> moment of silence. <laughs> yeah. But to me, but you know, it's just shit. Yeah. It's just wood with some strings on it, and I can get some other wood with some strings on it. And it'll sound the same, because it comes from me or Mark or whoever it is. You know. um, Mark, when we uh, did an interview over the summer, you were you were obviously you were really excited about Magpie Salute. Yeah. You also said in your mind the band was only 13 days old because at that point you had had 13 gigs, I think. And well, so you've got a lot more under your belt now. Yeah. So you, uh, you and you both were telling me how excited you were to see how it grew. So yeah. how's it grown? How's oh, it we're grown? sick of each other. <laughs> it's fucking done, man. We dared each other to do it, and it's over. <laughs> I mean, literally in the last couple of days, the growth each day, it, 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 I'm, I, I mean, it's, it's not bullshit. I'm astounded over and over and over again at because it's like after all the work that we've done and, and 60 shows or whatever and living together in extreme circumstances, um, the personality of this group of people coming out and the music the personality of the music is coming out so it's like 
it's flipped now you know it's it's not remnants of what used to be it's this brand new band playing some older songs getting ready to move on to this new place you know this is just the stuff usually people do this in garages or in rehearsal rooms and we just did it in front of everybody uh, we were doing an interview on Sirius earlier today, and the guy asked me what similarities there were. And, and you know, with Shake Your Money Maker, I was 15 when I started playing guitar, really, you know, and started writing for Shake Your Money Maker when I was 17. But it's all emulation. You're emulating your, because I was living at home. I didn't have any life experience, you know. So I remember thinking, I want to write a song like that, you know. I want to write. Uh, you know, it's the last song on Beggar's Banquet, you know, uh, Salt of the Earth. And I'm like, that's the kind of song I want to write, you know. And so that's, and Chris wanted to be Rod Stewart, period. That was it. No, no, t no two <laughs> no bones about it. And, uh, but, you know, through that, we came, we, we made this great record. I'm incredibly proud of it. It, it. it set us up for a life, a life, you know. And, uh, but it wasn't until Southern Harmony that we became who we were. And that was our first stamp as to like, we stepped into ourselves and this is what we're gonna be. And it's not about all that other shit. It's not about the stones or the faces. This is about us. And in the same sense, because this came across or came about so organically, what I liked about it was that it was just, it just kind of grew. It's just this little thing that grew. It's like, yeah, let's come, let's get together and play for a weekend. That'd be fun. We go and do it, and we felt like there was something special, and we felt like there was something there. And we felt like, oh, wow, let's try this. Let's dip our toe in the water. And then, you know, the Gramercy came, and then it was like, well, shit, let's keep doing this and grow. And, well, we have a record and this, and we have a new song and this. And then we went on tour, you know. And poor John, man. I mean, he had the biggest shoes to fill because he's in my opinion, an incredibly talented singer. He loves me, he and I are really good friends. He loves the Black Crows, he loves Chris. He wants to show his honor and respect for the work we did. And he's gonna do that, but he's also bringing himself to it. And like Mark was saying, most front men do that when they're 20, playing to two people in a club. You kind of get all the kinks out. Right. But now he's kind of thrust into <laughs> this zone where people are constantly drawing comparisons. And he's handled it brilliantly because he's a gentleman and he and he really does respect and love this. And you can see it all over him. And, and that kind of works with all of us. And this year was about us living, kind of st really being born, living off of something, the music that we all had reverence for, be it Crow's music, be it cover tunes, Mark and I songs, whatever. But come February when we go into the studio, that's where we become ourselves and start, you know. But do you th <coughs> the songwriting that you're doing and the recording you're doing, I guess is gonna be a lot different than if you had decided to do that a year ago because you do have all these shows under your belt. It, you know, look, I mean, everyone is a professional. I mean, everyone, and the funny thing is that everyone has played in a, con in a context together in different contexts. So. To me, what was cool is me and Joe have had our thing for years, Joe Magistro, and, and, and he's my favorite drummer of all time to play with. And then Sven came in, and, then, and I've always loved Sven, and Sven to me is like me and Mark in the sense that when a bass player comes and lays it down, Sven will instantly choose the right shit to play all the time, period, you know? So uh, on some of the other records, I had to play bass, because what, it wasn't really happening, but when Spin came on board, it's like, I don't have to do that, you know? And so there's that contingent, and then there's Mark, and then John's coming in new, and John and I were in Hookah Brown, and I respect his talent, so it's cool to fit this puzzle together and just to see how it's gonna all work. But everyone's of that level where they're gonna bring the necessary amount. And then we brought in Nico, and so Nico's positive energy and Nico kind of brought this youthful exuberance and uh, and can-do attitude where he remembers all the parts that we forgot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 
<laughs> because his brain hasn't gone right. yet. He's still in his 30s, right. so he can still see and hear and well, remember. You, you know, so. you just played the parts. You created them, and he studied them. <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's different. <laughs> exactly. Well, it also, um, and this is really showing up to me recently, as we learn how to make three guitars work, it, it allows our thing to, to, to expand into a new thing other element and and we're figuring out how all that works and it's getting to be so strange sometimes it just sounds one like one big guitar and then it'll instantly be three separate different instrument you know it's it's getting to be laser surgery now after slugging it out all year together you know? and, and rich you, you were talking about how on you know it felt like southern harmony is where the black crows became a more original entity which is also when when mark came around so, um, what did he bring to the? Well, first of all, where did you find him? <laughs> and and uh, and what did he bring, like m musically? Was it was it part of that development you were talking about, or how much of it was because you had this new blood and new? He ideas? was just sleeping on the street in the Sunset Strip. <laughs> and Chris kicked him and said, "Hey, you want to join this band?" <laughs> now, uh, Chris met you through Broken Homes, right? It was there was some sort of Broken Homes connection. Well, I remember a writer at NME suggesting to one of us, or to me, that I should check out you guys because he had just done one with Chris, and that we were on onto similar things, and we should we should find each other. And then I was given this promotional copy of the record before it came out, and um, I had just I hadn't bought a, a, a ghetto blaster with my Epic record. You know, advance money in the back. I was Which like, was burning it tree. Right? Of my '66 yeah. Dodge Dart with my pregnant yeah. wife in the front. <laughs> and we go to drive home and put it in. And I get the second song starts, and I pull the car over, and I just, oh my God, listen, that guy sing. He sings like I play guitar. I go, we're gonna play together, and we just drove home and listened to the record. And, and next thing I know, they're coming to town, and we're pals. You know, so it was instantaneous. How much did you guys then and, and now work out guitar parts versus just start playing and play off each other? Zero. <laughs> Absolutely zero. We faked our way into this. I mean, I lied every step of the way. I, you know, I mean, really, well, I didn't take lessons to do any of this. You just make your way. You, like you said, you, you, you copy until you, can, until you understand it. You know? I mean, the parts for the songs were the parts. So Mark... So the songs had their thing, and Mark just came in and brought everything he brought, you know, which f for the first time, and I remember seeing an old video of this interview I did right after Mark joined the band, and it wasn't necessarily a nice comment about Jeff Cease, but I said, uh, you know, for the first time, kind of Mark, what he brought to the table warranted two guitar parts. You know, Shake Your Moneymaker was almost like ACDC. It was just you know, strumming the chords and just doing this thing for Jeff. I mean, he would just basically double what I was doing. But when we got to that, I mean, that was 22 months and 350 shows on tour, and we learned how to be a band. And we really learned how to be a band on Heart because Heart's crowd hated us. And so we just kind of turned our backs and just played to each other for the first time and really learned how to play on that. And then you could just see how it kept growing. And the songs kept growing. We had, pro we could have put at least one, if not two, records out before Southern Harmony of stuff because we just Chris and I just kept writing and, you know, and but we were still on tour, so it was like, oh shit, you know. And then by the time we got to make, you know, the record, Chris and I went in his garage in Atlanta and just wrote it over three days. It was a weekend, and uh, we were, and then George was up talking on the phone the whole time. He was never downstairs, and he opened the door. We're like, finished. You know, he's like, you want to get started? We're like, man, we're done. And then we went in the studio and made it in eight days, just live. I mean, everything was one or two takes, done, just get in and get out. And Mark came in, and we just, every, pretty much every solo was, you know, all the parts were just played. I mean, every solo was one take, except for sometimes Salvation. Mm, yeah. It, it was just, in, it was just an explosion. and. I had been on tour myself and playing, and, and uh, so we we met each other 
ready to play. You know, they had been on the road, I'd been on the road, and, and it was just time. And, and they, it's like it was the same thing when I saw Woodstock when I came. Since the plane, like, blow it or whatever happened, trying to get there, I got there and we said hi. And they went on, and I watched for the first time, and I after realizing, wow, this is really good, and then watching, and then going like, Rich needs a foil. Like, I saw you go through almost all of your stuff, and then start to go through stuff, and like, oh, he needs someone. That's what's missing. That's the only, you know. And, and that, then it dawned on me exactly, like, it's our thing, and, and how it works. It, it's, it's, it's a pushing around, but it's also a move, you know, it's, it's, it's a language. It's really cool. I mean, it's funny because John talks about it as well. Listening to Steve, there's a whole, the way Chris sings with Steve and the way Steve and I would play and then the way Mark and I would play, it's always this kind of amoeba, like pushing and pulling the whole, <laughs> the whole time. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it, it lends itself to something pretty interesting. So, but that's the thing. I mean, right now it just seems effortless with the two of us playing because it's just, we're, we're just always there together. And even from our solo stuff, I mean, Mark's got songs that are the same title as my song. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, wrote the show, you know, it's you like, at the same time. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of interesting correlations that we have in common. So, so you, you mentioned you're going in the studio in February. Yeah. Um, so, so songwriting, are you doing collaborative songwriting or are you each bringing in separate songs? Are you no, we're, right. we're trying to do collaborative songwriting, really with me, Mark, and John. Um, if, if 10 people wrote, I mean, it would be a nightmare. Just trying, just logistically, it's just like, wow, shit. I mean, we'd be looking at a, could be looking at 100 songs. <laughs> so, you know, Mark and I and John are really starting. We already, I sent them about 35 things, and we've, I just started writing at sound checks, and we have about five new things. Mark sent me some cool stuff. So it's good for, the two of us that are so focused on finishing our shit to not finish your stuff, you know what I mean? Just to kind of hold yourself back and so, be like, okay, you know, which is good. It's a good exercise. And I should say, so this is a singer, it's John Hogg, just John so Hogg. If anyone doesn't know. Um, so but the way you were describing writing uh, Southern Harmony with Chris, so was your guys songwriting live together, the two of you in a room? making these songs sometimes or some uh, you know early on it was that way I mean, you know um, you know Chris's enthusiasm was a strong catalyst he did bring a lot of enthusiasm and he and, he, and Mark does it now too he'll hear I'll play some it, you know stuff and I you know, it's almost like I'm circling around I'll have a part and then I'll add this part and then I'll add that part and then put them all together and uh, so Chris would be like, oh man, that's great. Let's, you know, what about that? And then I would do this and I'd write a chorus and that needs a bridge and I'd write a bridge. And, and so it was, it was collaborative back then and it was much cooler and far more positive back then. Uh, as time went on, it got more uh, aggressive, <laughs> so to speak. You know, territorial. Territorial, maybe. yeah, just more like, you know, um, but it was, you know, it, it flowed. It was one of those things. It just kind of flowed. It's just brother stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's just brother stuff. It really well, Mark, we, we, stuff. you know, we hear about the brother stuff a lot. What, what's it like to be a bandmate in, in a band where the, the core members are feuding brothers? Was that difficult for you to, and, and other people to navigate and well, pick your spots? Well, early on, I mean, we were all confused and young and trying to figure stuff out in extreme situation. The thing that I... That I found was difficult is that at the core of this thing, they were separate. So everyone had to choose a side. That's, there was that the good crows and the bad crows, sort of, you know, what it ended up being, which is, well, it, was, it just. I was the good crow. <laughs> <laughs> and then you, but yeah. Then it was everyone else. But in the middle, kind of, you know, and it, but I don't know, you just, you did, if they were feuding, you had to be on one or the other side. It didn't allow us to get to know each other. I, I, I mean, obviously, you got to know each other musically, but you're talking about yeah. as, as people, as friends. Yeah, 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 now we get to, 
you know, I like this guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I could, I didn't know. Well, if since I could you didn't really know each other, what if you had gotten there and found out you didn't like him? Yeah. I mean, wasn't there a risk in that when you guys, when you but we already put did this that. guy? That works too, but it's not worth living through. How quickly did you realize once Ed and, and Mark came to Woodstock, did, at what point did it occur to you, this isn't just a fun weekend jam session, this can be a band? And then the next part is, but we need one more guy. But. You know, the, the groundwork was already there because I know what Mark's capable of and, and I know what he would bring. And, you know, like he said, he was supposed to come in the night before. We were supposed to have a rehearsal. His flight was canceled, or, and he had to spend the night in Chicago. And so we're, we've started. I mean, he came in halfway through our first set. It was like, <laughs> hey, yeah. you know, we didn't really have time to go over any songs. But then and he sat down, and within, you know, it was just like that. It was, it was the one, th it didn't leave. It never left. It's that connection that kind of uh, spans space and time yeah i realized that, that that you know for a while just personally i was trying to get a far away as far away from any of this as i could and and just, just what else is there you know and then now getting to sort of come back again and realize like it was like it never ended in a way it, there's stuff that's very much similar and exactly the same and will always be that that's the good stuff and the stuff that didn't work is gone. And, um, and I just realized, like, this is a huge part of my life. Whether I want it to be or not, I have to accept this is family. This really is my family more than anything else. You know, the history, I have a 30-year, 25-year history. I mean, it's like, there's a lot in there, you know. And, and even though if you counted days together, they may not seem like much, but they're potent days. Um, and, and of course, Ed was part of that. Ed Harsh, who was uh, with you in Woodstock, as you mentioned, and then was supposed to be in this band, and you know, died before he played the, the shows at Gramercy Theater here in New York, which were really your first shows um, outside of there. So I, I guess it's one of those things, as, as tragic as it is, it's also beautiful that you did have that reunion. I don't. Is, was, would, yeah, is that, that how you looked I mean, at it? Or? I, I would call Ed twice a year uh, since he left, you know, just to check up on him because I, I always loved Ed. And, you know, there was a couple, there was a record he and I played on in Canada, this Trues record. You know, we both were there at the session. And so I would always call him because he's at, at his his core, he has a gr he's a great person and has a great heart, you know. He was a good, a kind person, but also a brilliant musician. And so I would always check in but there's about five times where i'd be like all right i'm making a record you coming down all right man i'll come down and then like he would blow off the flight i, I can't get my you know it's like there was always something and he would frustrate me so bad i'm like man just fucking ed get it together <laughs> but when this happened and i and i called him and i said look mark's coming so you're coming down he goes i'll be there man and I was like, all right, he had to get a passport because he was in Canada. And I'm like, can you, you sure you can figure that one out? Yeah. Like, and so we almost had a running bet, like, oh shit, you know. <laughs> and I didn't want to tell Mark until I got a 70%, 70% chance this guy's coming, you know. Uh, but he came and, you know, he hadn't been playing a lot, you know, but he quickly settled in and played some brilliant shit and, and just now listening back to the record. It's like, shit. It's inspired. I mean, it's so like, it's one of those things. And it's always a shame that we uh, wait till someone dies before we truly appreciate what they bring. You know, and I always appreciated Ed and I always right. knew he was brilliant. But then it's just like, I, maybe you listen with bigger ears or you you microscopically focus on what's happening. But what Ed brought to the table is, is fucking stunning. Well, and, like playing these songs again with yeah absolutely without him yeah yeah, yeah. playing these songs without it made me understand like he cut a wide slot he was he was written into this music well he wrote himself into it you know what yeah. i mean no, yeah, but yeah, the, yeah. when you hear this music without him it 
and, and when you were playing. But the funny thing is when you look back at videos, and he's over there just. <laughs> Rolling smokes like, with one hand. What the fuck is he doing? He's just like banging on yeah. some shit. Like yeah. it just looks like he's smacking yeah. the keyboard. And then you listen back. Like, Jesus, yeah. man. What's he doing? And it was brilliant. I mean, it was absolutely brilliant. And, and when you played those shows, I mean, obviously none of you knew at that moment you were making a record that anybody no. outside of that room would ever hear it. So there's a, this sort of poetic that, that you did end up ultimately putting out his final yeah, performance. and no one had more fun that weekend than that. Yeah, I mean, either. he was like in he heaven. Was he was just... It was great. Know. I had a weekend with me and him stayed in the cabin next door and just stayed up laughing at cartoons like we always did. You know, just... <laughs> Belly laughing, old men laughing, you know, cartoons, <laughs> it was wonderful. And just, like, again, like, no time had passed whatsoever. You know, and I, I'd never seen him that happy, really, you know. It was, uh, it was incredible. And then you listen to the record, and it literally is us, like, saying hello for the first time. Because yeah. I got there late. And it's like, you can hear us saying hi to each other. It's right. heavy, yeah. Uh, as you start getting more original music and after the record comes out, I assume next spring or summer, when, whenever that may be, um, do you, will it really affect the way you're approaching these shows? Like, will you start dropping, you know, you'll have more original music, so you'll be dropping some of the covers or you drop some of the Crow songs? I mean, I, I, think that the, I think that the, the skeleton of the set will be what this band is, which is these new songs. I mean, it's not, it's no one's desire to go out there and play Black Crow songs for the rest of our life. Because but it's no one's desire to get rid of them. Either. But it's no one's desire to get rid of them, but because we're always going to celebrate that, you know, because it's, that's, it's a huge portion of my life's work, you know, and, and Mark's. And so... Someone said it really good the other day. This is the extension of everything that was. This is, you know, the continuation of the story. Like, this is... But to have that, have that skeleton of us, because once these songs are made, that will be us. Right. And then we can hang all these other ornaments on it. And right. And I'm sure over the years, when you when post crows and in between crows, you know hiatuses and whatnot, that when you're when you were playing your solo shows, you felt the reaction when you would play Black Crows music. I'm sure. And yeah. I mean, yeah, because everyone coming to see me was a Black Crows fan first. And, and that was, that's just the way it is, you know? And I've never made, I, I wasn't delusional enough to think that that wasn't the case. You know what right. I mean? And that's a good thing. That is a good thing. But, yeah. you know, I'm also making my own records and writing other songs too. And so the cool thing is for people to come and see me in a new or a different context and to see that things have changed. And, and so that's a good thing as well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, uh, and I, I will say, um, this, is, this is sort of a, a left turn, but just since we're here in New York and talking about the Black Crows, the 2001 fall shows at the Beacon were really meaningful for a lot of people. Uh, I don't remember exactly how close after 9-11 it was, but uh, it seemed like it, it was, was right after. Right after yeah. And, and the city, it was so, we, we everyone here was so broken. Our, our spirits and souls were really in a bad place and uh, you gave tr tremendous uplift at those shows so thank you for that yeah. I, I know there was talk about canceling them at the time well yeah that we were we were playing at the Greek that night September 11th and when that we were talking about this the other day when that happened we were just like you know we canceled the show and we were going to cancel the tour and we st our managers started calling around to promoters just saying they were like, please don't cancel these shows. I mean, we've gotten 500 calls from just saying they want to do anything but watch the fucking TV. And then when we came to those, I think it was five nights at the Beacon, we, we donated $150,000 of all, you know, basically all the profit from those shows to some stuff uh, to like a good cause. It was a 9-11 cause. But yeah, it was heavy. I mean, shit. Yeah. Jesus. And I'm sure the money was did great things, but I think what you provided spiritually was bigger yeah, yeah, than yeah. the money because the money could come from somewhere else, but that couldn't. And, and exactly, but it we was, wanted it was to, big. We have always had a huge love and appreciation for New York in particular, and wanted to do everything we could. 
you know. So Chris and I, I think it was 2001, but we had to fill in at Conan. Conan called us because we were playing uh, Conan O'Brien because we were playing um, at the Beacon. He's like, look, I, you know, I lost my guest. They're not flying in. Will you guys come down and do something? And Chris and I went down there and played a song, you know, and it was it was it was heavy, some heavy shit, you know. It's pretty crazy. Um. I was looking through a photo book by uh, Kirk West, no, he's, you know, and he had these photos from, ni ni I don't know what year it was, 93 or 94 of you guys playing with the Allman Brothers in a studio in, in Florida, Miami, I that think. That was 95, <laughs> and it was, we were playing with the dead, so we were playing with, at Tampa Stadium, and it was our first show with the dead, and last show with the dead, and, uh, and the, for some reason, at the same time, we were like, let's I don't know how we that went, happened. We went to Duck's house for a barbecue. Yeah, yeah, but then it was a day off. It was the night before that show, and we were in the studio with uh, the Allman Brothers, and you guys stayed. I left. Chris and I got in a fight. <laughs> yeah. And then Greg yelled at Chris, which was good. <laughs> <laughs> Greg yelled at everybody. Greg was like, he was Chris hammered. Was, Chris was running his mouth, and Greg's like, you shut the hell up. <laughs> at least you still have a brother. That's what he said. And yeah. Yeah. Greg's words, not mine. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. That's and, a very heavy statement. And Chris felt really guilty and came up and apologized to me the next day. It's probably the only time he ever apologized. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. But did, any, did anything ever come out of it? Like, like, was there ever an intent for, to record things, or was that just a fun Jamboree. No, just, you know, I, I remembered it. We were at Duck's house and then just went over to the studio. Duck Dunn was our sound guy's father. Oh, wow. So when we would go down to Florida, we would go over to Duck's house. And so it was kind of became this thing where every time Steaks we... Were, yeah, yeah, every time we would go down there, old Duck would invite us over yeah. and we would, you know... I don't know how we got it. The, they were rehearsing in their studio, that's the story, and Greg was drinking at the time and had pissed everybody off and they all bailed and left them. Because we were just gonna go say hi to them, see them rehearse, but they'd all left. Warren was there and Woody and, you know, a few, Mark, I think, was there. And, and then um, we ended up jamming some, but people, you know, it got, the silent alarm went off and there were all of a sudden people coming there's so sirens outside, there's cars without. He goes, he goes, well, oh no, they're banging on the door. There's badges. He's just like, well, Greg goes, do they got hoses or guns? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a fire department. We had, we had, um, we had smoked quite a bit. <laughs> and set the asylum alarm off. We got busted by the fire department. That's <laughs> Hoses are, do they have hoses or guns? That's, that gets right to the heart of the matter, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Did you look at the pictures? <laughs> yeah. They're great Air pictures. Have you seen them? Always. What's been the, the nicest surprise or, or just the nicest part of this, of, you, of your musical reunion? For me? Uh to see what a dad he is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's more like, I, f I feel like Mark and I have been on kind of a parallel journey and to learn a, a lot from Mark and, and actually the two of us watching each other and kind of getting to this point, you know, where you can lose your ego and you can lose your horse shit that you had when you were young, you know, and, and as a constant reminder to look over at Mark and be like, oh shit, I need to not be a dick here. You know what I mean? <laughs> Just like, I gotta try to drop the judgment or whatever it may be. I mean, what all the shit that everyone has to deal with. And it's really helped open my eyes to a whole other scenario in life, you know, which is cool. I think that's a, a huge reason for the success that's going on with this music, is that our only ag like, agreement to make the music was like, basically, let's not be dicks so we can have this in our lives again. And, 
you know? Let's just do whatever it takes so that that can live and realize it was cooler when it was around, even. Right, and you've gone through, you know, obviously, uh, perspective on, on these things are different at our age than they are when we were Absolutely. 20 or 25. Drama is, is boring, and, and there's, a, there's a trap that every band falls into where you, everyone takes everything fucking personally, and then you go in the back lounge, you start bitching about each other, and then you stay in your bunk, and then you just go. It's just this, it's like being in a band 101, you know, just, and, and that's easy to fall into. Those traps are easy to fall into. And so we have to be vigilant not to do that and realize that someone is having a bad day. Maybe it's not about you, <laughs> which right. seems so obvious. But it's just like, shit, man, you know, we all, we're musicians, everyone's weird anyway, because we're musicians. But then on top of that, you know, our oversensitivity or whatever we have to deal with, uh, we don't even realize how, I, I look at musicians as almost every one of us has Asperger's. It's just like, because we don't pick up on social cues when we're in these funks. Well, just we like up in the morning, this, just like. The, the irony of this yeah. last night, that like each one of us are the misfits that didn't really want to hang out with anybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then end up going, okay, now live together and see what happens if music happens. Yeah. <laughs> and people like John and Nico really help. Um, not that Nico's here. <laughs> I'm not just uh, I'm not just saying right. it because Nico's over there, and he's bigger than all of us. He'll beat right. us up. But it's more about the rea the reality of it. It's just like seeing things through their eyes, like seeing this. You know, Nico's an incredibly gracious person and, and grateful, and he, he shows gratitude every day. John is the purest, nicest, kindest human I've ever met, and he has gratitude every day. You know, sometimes I'll wake up and be like. Uh, you know, like, oh shit, what's going on today? And John just comes in with this smile, and like Nico's over there, like, hey, this is great. <laughs> you know, but that's important. Someone's got to yeah. do that. Because if not, then there's just a bunch of old assholes sitting up there, <laughs> just like, ah. Yeah, and I've had the benefit of a lot of shittier days than any of the days I'm having right. now. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I've had some really bad days. I had yeah. a dead day. Yeah. And it's all up from there. So it makes it all good. And is that, I mean, has it been hard for you over the years? Did you ever regret leaving the Black Crows or was it just what you had to do at the time? No, it was just what, I, you know, I was, I, I, what I was looking for wasn't there and I didn't, I, you know, I was caught up in the mortgage and the family that wasn't together and I was alcoholic and I was, I didn't know what I was doing and what I thought what I worked my entire life for to get, and I'd get there and didn't solve anything. Now what? You know, I was just delusioned and, and didn't have the balls to quit, really. To be honest with you. you know, I should have. A better yeah. man would have just said, I can't do this right now, you know, and left. But to get to, like, see these people night after night just, like, yeah. lit up. You know, right, the time on stage just, changes all the, the time off stage you yeah, forget yeah. about, right? It, this yeah. was, you know, Back in Black was a record I couldn't get away from in high school. And I think, like, Southern Army was somebody who's back in black. Right, right. In, in a sense, you know what I mean? A backdrop to their life, it's pretty, it's pretty powerful. And, and, um, right, and you had mentioned that before too, Rich, like they, like they, you grew up with these, you know, maybe not Back in Black, but you know, whatever, Dylan and Stone's records, that meant so much to you. I just and, went was in high school. Yeah, yeah I understand, but, eras, yeah. Like, no, but I mean, it doesn't matter, but, <laughs> I'm just, but it's the same concept, what I mean, yeah, whatever, whatever, that, whatever that incredible record is that, yeah, that right. was a soundtrack for your life, you've provided that for a lot of yeah, people as well. I mean, that's, I've, I've I mean, a lot of times, I'm, I'm oblivious sometimes. I'll meet people and they'll come around and they'll kind of like look at me weird. And I'm like, hey, just like, you know, like, I'm like, why is this dude looking at me weird, you know? <laughs> and then I, because I just, I'm unaware of it, but I re, then I, the guy will say, you know, Southern Harmony, you know, changed my life or, and, and then I, I'm like, oh shit, you know? And it's, it's, it's incredibly humbling to, uh, have my music do that to someone. I mean, when I first heard Dylan, or when I first heard, when I first got Neil Young, 
when I first heard, when I first heard like uh, Torn and Frayed and, f and it just fucking hit me like a diamond bullet, to quote Marlon Brando. <laughs> but it, that stuff is, is, uh, just shakes you to your core and it can be like your, it can be your life blood. It can save you. And that's the thing about like Black Crows fans and now, now Magpie fans. And, uh, <laughs> but the amazing thing is, is to see how, like I said this the other day, I was, we were playing a club in Florida and there wasn't a huge amount of people there and this, someone was out there just dancing just by themselves, just like rocking the hell out. And I was like, and I was like, it just, it, 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 it filled me with so much joy and it impressed me at the bravery that still in this day with a fucking Netflix and your phone and your bullshit and everyone has to deal with that someone can allow themselves to be taken to a place in an authentic scenario and in, without an, a care about what anyone else around them is doing or how they look to someone. They're just having, they just let that happen to them. They ride that wave. But that's what you're doing. Yeah, well, hey, they're doing it. They're the one that's tapped in, you know? And there's nothing on earth better than that, to watch right. people lose themselves in this, in this medium, in this forum, right. you know? And I had, I had a conversation recently with O'Teal, who said very much the same thing, that yeah. that was his, most favorite thing in the world on oh, stage was just to see somebody doing that. Yeah. Um, I think it's we're brave, getting... man. I mean, it, it really is because people just let it out. They're just, it's cathartic and it's, it's amazing. Um, we're getting close to the end here. We're going to take some questions from the crowd. I think, is it t that time now, Brad? Yeah. So if anyone has questions, uh, good questions, I hope, uh, <laughs> raise no your hand. No shit questions. Brad's got the microphone. Do you have a shit question? My... <laughs> it's awkward, it's awkward. All right. Hello. Um, my question is on the news today. You would know the news today. The news today? As the crow flies. Oh, yeah. All right. How do you know about that? Well, I... They released, they released I eat Vegemite. Oh, okay. They're doing a lot. There's a lot of... There's a lot of rumors. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Around. Are you threatened by it? Are you uh, insulted by it? Are you There's glad you got in first? <laughs> uh, and will you play Licken? Because, <laughs> because you know, you know, this is what I'm travelling the world for. <laughs> and don't make me go see it. What was that question? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, if it's, I... it's a complicated situation. It is, and it's really only, if Chris is just, had just kept his mouth shut all year and just decided to play songs that he and I wrote, I mean, that's his prerogative and that's cool. And he'll bring himself to those songs. The fact that he ran his mouth all year about how stupid this is and, and how we're just a cover band and then to turn 100 degrees, 180 degrees, and just be a cover band with the B Squad. It's kind of like, you know, it's very hypocritical. But he has every right to do that. And if for whatever reason he needs money or whatever, I mean, or whatever reason that he's doing that, he has every right, and I wish him well. You know, I'm, we're more excited about going into the studio and seeing what we can do as a band, you know. And, you know, that's, that's what's more important to me. And so, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, although there's, a, there's a, a glaring hypocrisy to the whole thing, he, he can do that, and, and I wish him well. You know, I've got Mark Ford. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, quick question. So um, you're doing the album in February. When will you guys uh, do the tour for that? Can't wait to uh, 
see some more shows. Just loving this, and please don't stop. Um, it'll take a month or two to make the record because it's a double album, so it's going to be long. So we'll, I mean, we'll be out next summer. Yeah. Yeah, we have to do one more. Okay, one more here. <laughs> have us at your house, man. <laughs> oh, we'll do that. <laughs> He's got to play Lincoln. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> uh, thanks uh, for your uh, inspiration. I guess it wouldn't be a, a question without technicality since we're here for you know guitar world. Um, some of us like to emulate you behind closed bedroom doors. Maybe you could recommend something, equipment, guitar, st uh, brand that maybe isn't as higher end. Maybe that's more um, attainable. Thank you. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, it's just like what? Uh, do you have? Do you have like? like are there any rec uh, suggestions of like stuff that's more attainable to people instead of, you know, stuff that that we play that costs a lot of money? I guess um, it really just comes from you. You know, the sound comes from you. The the how you choose to do it. There, there's no way that anyone's ever going to sound like me. I could never sound like Jimmy Page when I was playing his parts. You know, I, I, it was funny because I played with Bad Company last year. I just filled in, and it was like, you know, I was hoping for some free that I, you know, it didn't really pan out. But I, I did play some Bad Company stuff, and uh, and it was cool. But you know, th that I, I I don't sound like that, and so. You know, I mean, there's certain people... You wouldn't sound like that if you played his rig. Yeah, yeah, even if I played his rig. So it really doesn't matter, like, what, how much you spend on stuff. It really just comes from you. You know, Jimmy would pick up my guitar and sound like Jimmy Page. I'd pick up his guitar and I'd sound like me, you know, and that's just, that's just how it's going to be, you know. So, I mean, there's cool shit out there to buy. It's, you know, if, you, if it looks good and you think it sounds good, just check it out, you know. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Thank cool. you, Mark. Thank you all. Thank you all listening in the great internet. Um, we're going to take just like a really short break and reset here. And these guys are going to play a couple songs. I think Nico's going to come up as well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So thank you. Don't go anywhere. Wow, 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 wow,
All right, guys, everyone ready? We're going to get back. We're going to bring uh, Mark and Chris back, uh, Rich back up, and Nico's joining them now. And uh, remember, I know everyone here and out there, uh, Wednesday and Thursday night at Irving Plaza, tomorrow night at uh, Fairfield, Connecticut, Magpie Salute. And, uh, well, you'll see. You're not going to want to miss it.
Nico. El Caliente. As I stare into the frozen starlight, my hand burn with the scars of past life. I see past all the falling chimneys home for me. What is home for me? As I charge into the of your light Stand on the fading sunlight Oh, it will return next morning Home for me What is home for me I can't wait to find Silence gave me into my soul I brought you this morning Which one will you be? And then you know him to me As I stare into the frozen starlight My hand burn with the scars of past life I see Past all the falling chimneys Home for me What is home for me? I can't wait to find A home for me Home
So this is a uh, Faces song that we do. Thank you kindly for thinking of me. If I'm not smiling, I'm just thinking. When all is done and spoken, you're up for hours. No time left now for shame The rising behind me, no more pain When swept stars blink and smile Another song, another
our reach Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Nico. Magpie salute. Be this uh, Wednesday and Thursday at Irving Plaza. I'm even more excited now. Thank you. It's going to be great. Thank you all for coming out for, uh, to the cutting room for Guitar World and Backstory event. And uh, there is another show that was supposed to be 